Our path starts with right view. Realizing that our actions are important because they do have consequences. And the fact that our actions are important underlies the value of a lot of the things we know are good in life. We know that generosity is good. We know that gratitude is good. But if you think about it for a while, you realize that generosity is good primarily because people choose to be generous and it has good consequences. Gratitude is good because it's right to honor the times when people have chosen to help us, to good, do good things for us. It's not that they had to do them or that they were fated to do them. It's because they chose to do good things, to be helpful to us, to benefit us. And from our understanding of the importance of action and choosing skillful actions over unskillful ones, that leads to a higher level of right view, right view the right view about the Four Noble Truths. Learning how to look at our own actions, look at our own minds to see where are we causing stress, where is the stress to begin with, and then to look deeper into the minds to see what in the mind is giving rise to that particular stress that's weighing down the mind. And then doing what we can to abandon that cause, developing whatever qualities of mind are needed to abandon that cause. That's the right use of right view. But the Johns often warn, and the Buddha himself warns, that people can have right view and they can misuse it. The Buddha's image is of a snake. If you grasp the snake properly right behind the head, it's not going to bite you. But if you grasp it at the tail, it'll turn around and bite you. You have to learn how to hold on to these things properly. And there are many cases, my time with the John Fung, and you read about other Thai John saying the same thing, that people can have right views, but the way they hold on to them, the rightness is for the sake of wrongness. And you notice this in two ways. One is using the wrong teaching at the wrong time. There are teachings on not-self, and there are teachings on self. And you have to know, when do you use teachings on self, and when do you te use teachings on not-self? If you get very doctrinaire, there, well, the only real truth is the not-self. And that quickly turns into, there is no self, which raises all kinds of questions and all kinds of problems. So the teachings were not meant to be problems, they were meant to be tools. When you're working on developing your mind, developing your actions so, so the more skillful, who you're going to rely on. Well, you've got to rely on yourself. You get examples from other people, but you realize that it's really up to you. And at this point, the teaching on self is really, really useful. Or when you find you're holding on to something that's causing suffering, okay, that's the time you have to think about not self. Or whatever you're holding on is not really you or yours. That way you get use out of these teachings. Similarly with the teaching that all feelings are stressful. There's a case in the canon where one monk had been asked by someone from a, another religion, what's the result of action? And the monk says, well, the re all action results in stress, which is a Jain view. And the person from the other religion said, I never heard any Buddha say that. You better go go back and check with the Buddha. So the monk does. And the Buddha says, You fool. And then Udayan pipes in and says, Well, maybe he's thinking about the teaching that, you know, all feelings are stressful. And since actions lead to feelings, then all actions lead to stress. And the Buddha says, Another fool. When you're asked about action, you act you respond in terms of the three feelings. There are pleasurable feelings, there are painful feelings, there are feelings that are neither pleasurable nor painful. 
you want to talk about the fact that ultimately even the pleasure has an element of stress in it. That's not the time to talk about that. There are other times when that teaching is appropriate. So this is one of the ways you have to be really careful about right views. When do you use a particular right view? And when there are certain views that are said to be right, but they're not right for that particular time and place, that particular level of the practice. So that's one area where you have to be very careful about making sure that you are not just only holding two right views, but actually using them rightly, because that's what they're for, is to be used. The other time, of course, you have to be careful about this is when you're holding onto right views to make yourself a right person. And that's not what they're intended for. In other words, you're trying to you actually get into arguments about this. Who's right? Who's wrong? And John Cha has a really nice talk about this topic. Everybody has their right and wrong. The question is who's right and who's wrong. There's no final judge. But if you're holding on to your rightness and it's causing you to suffer, you can say, okay, something's wrong here. That's not what we're right for, or that's not what right actions or right views or right whatever are for. They're to be developed so you can abandon the cause of suffering. But if you're using them to create causes of suffering, okay, something's wrong. John Cha tells the story of the, some guys who are in the forest. and. They hear a rooster crowing. One of them asks, is that a rooster crowing or is that a hen crowing? And the other three decide to put their heads together and say, oh, it's a hen. And the first one says, wait a minute, how can a hen crow like that? And they say, well, it's got a mouth, right? And they argue back and forth like this. So the first one, who was right, ends up in tears. He's so upset because he knows he's right and every, no one else will recognize the fact that he's right. But then arguing to the point that you're in tears doesn't accomplish anything. So you have to look carefully at your right views. Make sure you use them rightly so they are right for the purpose of rightness and don't turn into being right for the purpose of wrongness. In other words, your discernment has to be all around. You can't just hold on to the fact that you're right. You have to look to the question of, is the way you're holding on to your rightness causing suffering or not? Always refer it back to the Four Noble Truths and look at yourself in terms of those Four Noble Truths. Look at what you're doing in terms of those Four Noble Truths. Because that's what they're for. So you can watch yourself in action as the body acts, as your words act, as your thoughts act. Look at where they come from. Look at where they're going. Don't just get into them and ride around. Step back from them and see who's driving them. That's how you learn how to step back from your views. Because that's what right view is for, is learning how to step back from your views and see them as actions. They learn when they're skillful, when they're not. And we use them in that way, then they achieve their intended purpose. And then you can put them down. Remember the simile of the raft. Ultimately, even right views have to be put down. Because the goal is not measured in terms of right views and wrong views. And John Lee has a nice Dharma talk on this one. Nirvana doesn't have right views or wrong views, doesn't have views at all. But you can't get there without views, correct views, right views, and using them rightly. And the fact that you can let go of views ultimately. If you couldn't let go of your views, okay, then you'd always be stuck on something. So as he says, you look at your views to see where there's wrong, either in the view itself or how you're using it. You let go of whatever's wrong. Then you hold on to what's right as, for as long as you need it, and then you finally let go of both. And that's when it gets good. <laughs>